All right, my country, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I call it to your time, Zoom. Ladies and gentlemen, you guys are welcome back to MC Potoski Talk Show here yeah, on YouTube, where you get the latest news and entertainment around the world. If it's your first time on this great platform where we react to all videos that comes our way, please consider to subscribe and Put on your thumb bell, and if you love what we do on this great platform, why don't you give us a thumbs up and also share this video? I appreciate all my subscribers. We got all my people. Bless you guys. And if you have anything to say about this video, you can also drop your comment at the comment section, and we will get back to you as soon as possible. Ladies and gentlemen, without wasting more time, guys, let's dive into this video. I'm not one of those lawyers that may go and meet a judge like Nicodemus at night to say, Help me. I fight my own in court frontally. This case is bad, bad, bad. Once you don't agree, I say, Take to another lawyer. I'm not going to have blood money on my hands to take on a case that I know is bad, is dead on arrival. So, because no country can survive without the rule of law, it's just not possible. It is our ability to subsume ourselves to the oppression of rule of law that makes us different from animals, that removes us from the herbation state of nature where life was short, nasty, and brutish. By 1885, Professor A.V. Dicey had already to discuss the concept of rule of law, which, in summary, is subjection of all persons before the law and equality before the law, whether you be a sovereign, president, head of state, or the transparent wretched of the earth or the hoi polloi, you must be one and the same before the law, before the law, nobles and commoners, slaves and slave masters. Once you begin to distinguish as between categories of people, then there's going to be trouble and anarchy. That was why last year the president missed it when he said national interest, in quote, should be subordinated to rule of law. That was wrong, because national interest is defined by every government according to its own blood binoculars, which is normally government interest, not national interest. But the rule of law itself predates man. It started from the Garden of Eden. It was the violation of the rule of law in the Garden, the rule of, law in the garden of Eden that got God angry with Adam and Eve, and he decided to drive them away. Because he laid down some rules, thou shalt eat of all this food, all this food, but of that singular forbidden food thou must not taste. It is the violation of that rule of law in the Garden of Eden that, that God got angry and he had to drive it then. So making the rule of law central is very important. And uh, the president of IBA was here to, to look at some of these issues. And, Many distinguished panels actually looked at many of these issues very critically. And I think it was a way of driving it home to the present government that you cannot operate outside the rule of law. No matter what anti-corruption you say you want to do, no matter how you say you want to go after supposed enemies of state, you must first and foremost go within a constitutional and legal organogram and regime. Anything outside it then becomes anarchic and it's unacceptable in any constitutional democracy, Nigeria inclusive. But was that point driven home? I mean, I take you back to what you just said about how the president said, made that statement about how um, the national interest supersedes the rule of law. He said that in justification of certain actions of the executive, but also as a foreshadowing for what was to come, which was the rather scandalous removal of the Chief Justice of Nigeria, Walter Nogan, and his replacement by the current CJN, Tanko Mohammed. 
um, the Senate Minority Leader raised that point and was quite critical of the MBA and their stance in that matter or failure to take a stance. And he got rapturous applause as a result of that statement. You buttressed that point. You raised the Pakistani precedence where the lawyers took to the streets because of um, Musharraf's removal yeah. of Chowdhury. Yes. But you were contradicted by um, Femi Falana Essayan, who made a statement along the lines of the person's morals that it's difficult to don a cape. I'm paraphrasing. This is, I'm not quoting. It's difficult to don a cape for somebody who is whose morals are not quite up to Yes, car. Yeah, uh, I, I don't like <clears throat> discussing people, particularly when they are not there, but because we mentioned Femi Falana specifically, let me say he was dead wrong. He said that um, Mohammed Chaudhry, the then Chief Justice of, Niger of uh, Pakistan, Pakistan, was not accused of corruption. That is not quite correct. President Pavas Musharraf accused him of misconduct and abuse of office. of office. I do not know what greater elements constitute corruption than abuse of office and misconduct. Femi Falana may have been defining corruption from the narrow perspective of this government that I've seen in the last one and a half years. They think that corruption simply means the giving and taking of bribery. They do not seem to realize that political corruption, prebendalism, cronyism, favoritism, nepotism, they are all even, the, all the all the <laughs> they are even greater forms of corruption. Now, on the night of March, 2007, Pakistani lawyers poured on the streets when the then president, perverse um, Musharraf. Musharraf, removed the then chief justice of Pakistan, Mohammed Chaudhry, accusing him of mis gross misconduct and other criminal acts. And the lawyer said, No, you cannot do that without first subjecting him to a proper trial, and they poured onto the streets. For months and months, they literally shut down Pakistan. It, in fact, they had to force the government and the judiciary to bring back the chief justice. Even if you say Onoge was corrupt, quickly, at this moment as I'm talking to you, no court of law has tried Onoge to find him guilty of any crime. Even the Code of Conduct Tribunal, they removed him preemptorily with an ex parte order. Even when the proceedings were still going on and his jurisdiction had been tried, the Court of Appeal, in the case of Justice Onogo versus the CCT and others, actually held that the Court of, uh, Court of Conduct Tribunal was wrong to have ordered Onogo to be removed. So even as we speak, Onoga has never been tried nor convicted of any offense. They forced him out. All they wanted was to force him out of office. And that they have successfully done. Otherwise, why would the Court of Appeal wait for nearly three months before delivering judgment in such a simple matter that they could have delivered judgment from the following? By the time they delivered judgment, almost three months later, it, it was too late. But what but, are our so, chances? So, even if, so my argument is that even if Onoga were accused of corruption, what we are saying is that you must allow him to pass through the due process of law before you can remove him. And the Constitution is clear. Sections 153, 158, 291, 292, 3, pass A and B, section 21 of the third schedule, they are all clear that before you can remove a judicial officer. You must subject him to trial by the National Judicial Council. And that was why the Court of Appeal heard in Erelu Habib, the Supreme Court, as a matter of fact, in Erelu Habib's case, and the Court of Appeal in Ingajewa's case, that you cannot begin to try a judicial officer until he has first been disciplined by the NJC, which is independent, in accordance with the doctrine of separation of powers, ably propounded by great philosophers like John Locke, John Calvin, Immanuel Kant, and most ably propounded in 1748, 
by Baron de Montesque that the three arms of government must be distinct, different from each other so that there will be checks and balances. Yes, well, sir, now, you have cited, I have, to, I have to follow up, you've just cited constitutional procedure, Supreme Court precedent. All of these things should be inviolable. What are our chances as a democracy if people within the legal profession do not seem to grasp these simple concepts, mm. that the ends do not justify the means? Oh, well, what we are seeing, it's not that they do not know. They know. They know. It's just that um, they want to sidetrack the law nicodemously. It's an assault on the rule of law, which was where we started from. It's an assault on the rule of law. It means we are not ready to subject ourselves to principles of good governance and rule of law. Once you subject yourself to rule of law, then you will see that even if you were going to remove an organ, you could still allow the judicial process take its place. But what many of these people believe is what you call uh, mob lynching. Lynch, oh, you have accused him of uh, corruption. In fact, the government, the spokesperson, like Mohammed, say, oh, name and shame them. But when they have problems, Chief. when they have problems, they again run Chief back was, to the same judiciary that they had we'll denigrated. A short break, but just mm -hmm. before we take that break, um, what do we do? Because at the first plenary, at the conference, you know, it was, uh, it was, this issue was a major subject. But we'll come back. Let's take a break first. You're still watching The Morning Show here on RIT. <laughs> and with us in the studio, of course, is Chief Michael Zekome, a senior advocate of uh, Nigeria. Chief Zekome, before we took that uh, commercial break, uh, you had talked about the rule of law, you were talking about the Code of Conduct Tribunal, the Onogan case, you know, and I uh, wanted to ask you that at the first plenary session, yes, at this year's uh, Nigerian Bar Association Conference, uh, this was a big issue, particularly the Code of Conduct uh, Tribunal. Yes. And uh, the title was Code of Conduct Tribunal, a clash of judicial and executive uh, powers. And you were on that, uh, you, know, yes. you were a speaker at that, uh, you know, symposium. Now, what is the way forward? Are there likely remedies to ensure that, you know, um, in the light of what you said about separation of powers, that you don't have the executive also, you know, uh, assuming judicial powers and using legal you know, platforms to, uh, to, to subvert the rule of law. Yes, power corrupts. And absolute power corrupts absolutely. Even in our own homes, if your wife and children don't check your excesses, the tendency will be that you will become a dictator, even within your own home. And dictatorship is not necessarily a military dictatorship. It could also come from a so-called democracy. President Saddam Hussein was going for elections, always going for elections in Iraq. Didn't we know that? But he was a dictator, maximum one for that matter, an absolutist. Now, at that first plenary session in which I participated, I described the Code of Conduct Tribunal as a bat, a bat, B-A-T. The bat will go to the animal kingdom, and tell them, I'm one of you, I'm an animal like you. The animals will say, how? You have feathers, you can fly, how can you be an animal? He will bear his teeth and say, look at my teeth, my canines. They are like your own. And really, when you look at the bat, it has teeth, like dog, like any... He say, look at my ears, my pinna, they are like your own. More importantly, look at my mammary glands, breast. A bat has breast. He says, so I'm one of you. Then they will accommodate the bat. Then after that, he will leave and go and meet the birds. Who say, I'm one of you. The birds will say, that's not correct. You are just coming from animal kingdom where you prove that you are one of them. You say you are joking. I'm one of you. If you say it's a lie, let's, let's fly. Because the bat flies like any other uh, bird. So we have a situation where Section 20 of the Code of Condor Bureau and Code of Conduct Tribunal Act, which is exactly like the fifth schedule, part one, paragraph 15, of the Constitution, setting up the Code of Conduct Tribunal as a court, more like as a powerful institution that could try public officers, strip them of their assets, 
has forfeit your access to the government of the Federation, even ban legislators, apart from removing them from holding office for 10 years. But do you know what? Such an organ that is so powerful, that is so powerful that can do these things, you will never find it in Section 6, Subsection 5 of the Constitution, which lists out what you call cause of superior jurisdiction, starting from the Supreme Court to the Customary Court of Appeal, and they are out there, Federal High Court, High Court. The National, I mean, the CCT is not there. Even on that Section 318, you will not find the Code of Conduct Tribunal listed there as a superior court of record. That is why the chairman and member do not take the judicial oath. So they are automatically an appendage of the executive, the presidency, who can recommend their removal subject to to turn majority vote of the Senate. In other words, the Code of Conduct Tribunal, which performs serial judicial functions, is not subject to the internal control mechanism of the National Judicial Council, NJC, which controls all other courts in accordance with the sections of the Constitution that I had earlier mentioned. You must look at Section 153, you must look at 158, you must look at 291, you must look at 292, you must look at Pass A and B of, uh, to the third schedule, Section 21. And you will find that it is the National Judicial Council that ought to have control over this Code of Conduct Tribunal. Some people have referred to say, oh, after all, the, 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 the Code of Conduct has said their appointment is like that of judicial officers. They were merely saying, the, the, the law was just merely provided that a member should either be a retired judicial officer or a person that is at par with a judicial officer. That does not make the members judicial officer. That was why in May 2015, the former Chief Justice of Nigeria, Justice Mahmoud, wrote to the, the, to the chairman of the CCT to say, don't refer or allow yourself to be referred to as justice. They are not justices. So you refer to them as honorables. So we, they are not, therefore, ju, um, uh, cause of superior record. And in fact, in the latest case of John Nogger that we are talking about, the two of them, two cases similar, the cause of appeal was insisted that, look, including Saraki's case, which is definitely was decided by Justice John Nogger. He said, although you have quasi-criminal jurisdiction, you can do all these things, but you remain an inferior tribunal. No matter how we garnish you, how we dress you in borrowed robes, the beauty, no matter how you engage in narcissism, in chest beating, beating, in grandstanding, you remain an inferior tribunal. You are never a court of superior jurisdiction. What we therefore need is a serious constitutional amendment. Because number one, the Code of Conduct Tribunal, the Bureau and Code of Conduct Tribunal Act, um, having exactly the same constitutional provisions in, um, in, in, part, uh, in, in, in part 15 of the Constitution. You, you do not do that. You do not make similar provisions, uh, part 5, sorry. You do not fix schedule. You do not make similar. Thank you for watching that video. We appreciate. And this is where I'm believing you guys. But if this is your first time on this great channel, please do it well to subscribe and put on your notification bell so that whenever we upload any video for this great channel, you will be the first person to see the video. So guys, see you guys some other time.